uh, Jesus refers to the world. And if you kind of look at some of these passages, you kind of would get an initial impression that Jesus has a very conflicted view on the world. So, for instance, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the garden and starts to have a conversation with Jesus, Jesus tells him, tells him God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So that's his conversation with Nicodemus. Uh, we go on to see when after Jesus rose from the dead and he's commissioning his church, he's commissioning his followers, he says to them in what we've known as the Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. So there's his, his view of the nations and the world and he's telling us to go out into the world. But we also uh, see when the devil is attempting to uh, uh, tempt Jesus, that the devil comes to him and says, took him a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all of their glory. So there's a temptation there with, with the world and the kingdoms of the world. And uh, Jesus reminds us, for what will a profit of man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? But we're also told by Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 that you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. So all these things from, from Jesus as, he, as he's, as he's uh, talking to us about the world and our, inter, and our interaction with the world. And so what are we to make of that? And he even goes on to say this, and he warns us, he says, woe to the world for temptations to sin. Woe to the world. And then he even goes on to say, what is our relationship like with the world? He says this, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So what can we make of all this? Well, some of these statements seem to be worlds apart. Get the joke? Ha ha, someone laughed. Some of these statements <laughs> seem to be worlds apart, some of these statements that, that Jesus is making. What is he getting at? What, what, how are we to kind of wrestle with this? Um, so what is a follower of Jesus to do with this? Jesus is driving at a very important point for all of us to keep in mind as we're living out our faith. And that is each and every one of us will face a tension between a strong negative pull of the world around us and simultaneously, the call of Jesus to love the world in which we've been placed. So, a good question might be, what is the world? When we're kind of talking about the world, what, what is that? Can we say that Jesus is talking about everything in the world? We should be cautious about everything that's out there, everything that's in the world. So, if I look at a beautiful sunset, am I potentially sinning? Or... If I enjoy the grandeur of the mountains, is that opening me up to sin? Is that necessarily sin? Well, I can think we can safely say from the scriptures that Jesus isn't particularly talking about the creation itself. After all, he was there when the world was created, and it says all things were created for, by him and for him. All things were created by him and for him. And the Father declared in Genesis, when he had made everything, that everything was very good. And while it is true that since the fall, the creation has been corrupted, and uh, it is not the original, and it is all very good, we see that, but we still see beauty, we still see goodness, we still see grandeur in the creation. So it can't be everything in the world. So 
Another possibility is, is Jesus telling us to remove ourselves as far from the worldly influence as possible. In other words, we're here in a university town. There's plenty of influence that's out there that might pull us in a negative direction. Should Good Shepherd be a commune, pull up our stakes, and go maybe to Potter County somewhere in the woods, just to the north of us, and set up shop there, and remove ourselves as far away from the influence of the world as possible. Is that what he's telling us to do? Well, there's a, there's a problem with that. Because as soon as I go into that commune, as soon as you go into that commune, we bring something with us called sin. It's clinging to us. And you know what? It rears its ugly head soon enough in our lives and in the lives of those around us. We rebel against, we be rebelled against God, and it has broken our relationship not only with Him, but with each other. We're fooling ourselves if we can pull up stakes and move to some place and just kind of live out in, in total peace, because the minute I go in there, peace is ruined. It's completely ruined. Maybe not when you guys go, but when I go, it's it's, it's a mess. So what is this world that we're supposed to be uh, guarding against? Well, let's think about this a little bit. The world that Jesus is warning us about has a subtle way of sneaking up on every one of us. It's a subtle way in which it sneaks up on us. It may come weaseling into your life when you look at a friend's Instagram photo and you hit the heart button, but deep down inside, you're kind of jealous. It comes weaseling its way in. It may blindside us when a coworker who's doing a decent job at work gets a promotion and we're skipped over in that promotion. And all of a sudden, we start... Instead of feeling happy for that coworker, resentment is building up in us. Why weren't we recognized? It may come the first thing in the morning when we start thinking about all the things on our plate and anxiety comes flooding in in our life and how can I get through the day? It may come when a TV show or even a commercial invokes feelings of greed or lust within us. It may come through our close friends and even our spouse who starts pulling you away from Christ and from your church community. In fact, there is nothing more warned about in the scriptures than who you would choose to be close friends with, who you would choose to align yourself with in marriage. It's just, they were warned by the Apostle Paul, do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. You know, some people uh, who are dating someone else are convinced that though they're a belie- you're a believer and a follower in Jesus, the other person is not a believer and not a follower of, uh, of Jesus, that you're going to change them. Let me just dispel that rumor right here and now. You're not going to change them. They will change you. That's what happens. They will, change, they will change you. The only marriage relationship that the Bible speaks again, of course, marriage between a man and a woman, that's what script, that is scriptural, but the marriage relationship that the Bible speaks against is not uh, different ethnicities marrying each other, a man and a woman from different ethnic backgrounds, different skin colors, or any of that other stuff. The Bible warns us about a believer marrying an unbeliever because the drift is, is our general tendency and drift is towards unbelief. And if we think we're strong enough with who we're dating and that they're going to be changed, God may work in their life to change them, but think long and hard of who you are forming a close relationship with in your life. So here's what it comes down to. What do you love? What do you really love? Because the enticement is there. Satan is still showing God's people 
the kingdoms of this world and all of their glory. He said to, G- to Jesus, all of this I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. All of this I will give to you. Showing the kingdoms of the world. Now to Jesus, he shows all the kingdoms of the world, but he doesn't have to go that far with us. Let's admit it, right? Right here and right now, let's admit it. He only shows a little snippet of a kingdom. That's all he has to entice us with, a little snippet of a kingdom, not all the kingdoms of the world. And we fall time and time again for what? A lesser glory. The kingdoms of this world and their glory is a lesser glory that we fall for time and time again. We settle for it. We settle for that lesser glory. So, I want you to listen to what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that there isn't a glory of sorts in pursuing the kingdoms of this world. Guess what? There is a glory of sorts. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a temptation. Otherwise, it would be an enticing an enticement to us. Um, but what we fall for is this lesser glory, rather than pursuing the glory that is found in a relationship with your Creator, in a relationship with God, and in God alone. Instead, we 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 jettison that. And look for something that is entirely unsatisfying. So, if we think about our lives, what would displace that lesser glory? And we think maybe of how we've tried to address that in our own lives. How you might have addressed that. How I might have addressed that from time to time in in my own life. And sometimes it's kind of like this. Well, you know what? I'm going to buckle down in my life and I'm going to resist the kingdoms of this world, the lesser glory that is out there. I'm going to have a determination to to do that. I'm not going to pursue what the world has to offer. Well, how well is that working out for you? If you and I are honest with ourselves, when we start thinking in terms like this, I am not going to be greedy. I am not going to be lustful. I am not going to be a gossiper. I am not going to lose my temper. I'm not going to pursue career in such a way that my identity is wrapped up in the career. I am not going to, and you fill in the blanks with a million other things. When we start determining in our life not to do something What do we start thinking about? The very thing that we determine not to do. That's the things we start thinking about more and more. And we wind up thinking about them. And as we're thinking about them and how we're not going to fall into that trap, what do we do? We fall into the trap. Once again, settling for a lesser glory. There is a glory of sorts in pursuing those things, but it is a lesser glory. Jesus knew the answer to this temptation uh, to pursue the glory of the kingdoms of this world and all that they have to offer. He knew that. His response to Satan, to the devil, was this. You shall worship the Lord your God. You shall worship the Lord your God. And him only shall you serve. The greater glory that this world cannot deliver is found when you worship the one who made you. Worship the one who created you. Worship the one who has put you on this earth for a purpose. And as you worship him, as you're in relationship with him, you're flooded with his greater glory that he gives to you, and, he take, and, and your life takes on a meaning and a purpose that none of the lesser glories can bring. None of the lesser glories can ever bring. There's a, a beautiful young lady that I know that it seems like 
every day she's posting a new profile picture of herself on social media. Every day. She's a beautiful young lady. And she posts that every day. And she usually has some sort of caption with these, these photos. And some of, they usually read something like this. This is one of those captions. Living your authentic self is the best gift you can give yourself. Living your authentic self is the best gift you can give yourself. While that sounds good, and I can understand why a person may want to do that, think about that for a moment. Think about that. Living your authentic self is going to disappoint you at some point, and say pretty quickly. Why did I do that again? I guess that's my authentic self. I guess that's all there is that this world has to offer. I guess that's all there is to life. We're settling for a lesser glory. The Bible promises us that if anyone is in Christ, he, is a, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That's our real identity. That's the real self that God wants to give to us. Not the perverted and, 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 and uh, corrupted self. The new self that is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. There is a greater glory that God wants to give you. And as you embrace that gift, you can begin to love the world and understand what that means to love the world. And you understand the limitations of the lesser glory of the world around us and point people to the greater glory that is found in Jesus. So to be guarded against the world is to begin to understand those limitations of the kingdoms of this world and what they have to offer, that they are a lesser glory, and our interaction with the world and loving the world in which God has placed us is when we're in a relationship with him and we receive that greater glory that begins to displace, not by our willpower, not by our determination, but by God's grace that he has given to us, this greater glory that is found in the cross of Jesus Christ, the glory of God, the forgiveness of our sin, this greater glory that we've received that begins to displace from our lives this lesser glory that we were pursuing that we thought would bring satisfaction. Let's pray. Father God, help us to see right now the foolishness of pursuing the kingdoms of this world and the lesser glory that they have to offer. And instead, to pursue you and the greater glory that you offer to us, the glory of your Son shining from the cross and offering to us forgiveness. But not only offering to us forgiveness, but you offer us the gift, those who have put their faith and trust in you, you promise the gift of the Holy Spirit that in our baptism that you have placed upon us your very name, you have adopted us into your, uh, into your family and have given to us the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Father God, to embrace that, the greater glory that we find in and through Jesus, our Savior. We pray in his mighty name. Amen. Let us stand and, and confess our faith.